If you're into smart homes and IoT devices, then you've probably come across MQTT, whether you know it or not. Smart plugs such as Sonoff devices, Flash with Tasmota, and Shelly relays often use MQTT for communicating with your smart home. If you're into solar, then that might also use MQTT. The respected brand Victron uses MQTT for communication with some external systems, for example the VRM portal, or if you're using Node-RED. Or if you're a fan of the Mikrotik networking product range, then they also integrate MQTT now into their router OS system, so you can control your routers and switches remotely or get sensor data from them. In this video, I'm going to discuss the devices in more detail, and I'm going to discuss what an MQTT client is and the broker as well. So let's dive in. MQTT is a lightweight and fast protocol which makes it perfect for IoT devices that need to send small amounts of data but reliably. MQTT is based on messaging, so each piece of data is considered as a message and will normally include a specific piece of information. For example, a message might include a command to turn a light on or off. There's going to be a lot of talking in this video, but if you want to understand MQTT then you're in the right place. A popular MQTT broker in the home automation space is Mosquito, and that's because it's free and open source, but it's also fast and reliable and can run on nearly any device. So for example, for Raspberry Pis it can run on easily, but even better if it's on something like an Intel NUC. There are other ones out there, such as RabbitMQ or HiveMQ, and these are used perhaps in more enterprise settings. I'll link in the description to an interesting benchmarking test that I found comparing different brokers. To install the Mosquito broker, I recommend either installing it on a Linux box, or if you run Home Assistant, then there's an add-on for it where you can install it with a click of a button. In Home Assistant, it will then look out for MQTT messages on certain topics, and then it'll add those as entities. Now let's talk about some software and hardware that uses MQTT, starting with Tasmota. So Tasmota is open source firmware and it is typically used on smart switches and plugs. It will send MQTT messages every time the state of the device changes, for example the relay turns on and off such as for a light or a plug, and it will also receive command messages as well to instruct it to turn the device on remotely. A common use is to connect it to Node-RED or Home Assistant so that you can control the device remotely and include it in your automations. Tasmota runs on two very common microcontrollers, so the ESP8266 and also the ESP32. I use this for a lot of Sonoff devices because they can usually fairly easily be flashed with Tasmota. Now let's talk about Shelly devices. I love Shelly devices partly because they embrace local control really early on. So you can control the devices with MQTT with the firmware that comes with the device. So they went a step further than IT Sonoff and allowing you to do this without even having to flash something like Tasmota. And because of this, I've never actually flashed Tasmota onto a Shelly device. I've always kept the firmware that's on there, other than doing some updates to the Shelly firmware itself if it's an old version. You can flash Shelly devices with Tasmota if you want to, and it does have pins available typically to be able to do this. I've already done a video on the Shelly 1PM Mini, so check that out if you're interested. This is part of the new Shelly Mini range. As I touched on at the beginning of the video, Victron also embraces MQTT for some of its products. If you don't know what Victron does, they do a lot of batteries, charge controllers, inverters, and anything basically related to solar. If you buy their Serbo GX, then this has got capability to communicate to a lot of the Victron devices, but also has the MQTT broker built in. And then you can use this either to send data to the VRM cloud for Victron, or you can use it to connect remotely like I do, using something like Node-RED. They also have quite an active YouTube channel as well, where they give some pieces of information about products, but they also do some showcases which I really like, where they show really big installations that includes lots of inverters and batteries and solar charge controllers. As I briefly mentioned, they do have a cloud service which is free, which basically means that you can get your devices to communicate to their cloud, and then you can see a nice portal with all your data in it. Things like the battery state of health, how much solar's coming in, how much your inverter is using, basically all the information about all your devices. So for this you will need a Serbo GX or one of that family range, or you can actually build something yourself. The software is called Venus OS, and then you could build something with something like a Raspberry Pi to communicate with those devices. 
I don't really use the VRM portal myself, but I do look at things locally using the MQTT broker. And then I include some things in Home Assistant about the state of my solar. For my security camera software, I use Blue Iris, and this has got fairly extensive MQTT support as well. So it allows you to send information about your cameras when there's motion events. And then you can use some of that information as well to call the API to retrieve some information such as images for a previous motion event. I use this in Home Assistant whereby I've got some MQTT sensors for each of my cameras so that I can have a look at the perimeter of my house and see when motion events occurred so that if something happens then it's easier to go back and have a look what's gone on. Once you've got all of your MQTT devices communicate with a broker then you typically want to have something that orchestrates this and does some automations for you. In my case I use a combination of Home Assistant and Node-RED for this and Node-RED makes it quite easy to use MQTT. It's got MQTT in and out nodes and so you can easily receive and send data using Node-RED. I currently use the MQTT nodes in Node-RED to look at information from my Victron products and also from Blue Iris as well. A fairly recent addition, I believe, is that Mikrotik has introduced MQTT into their router OS software. This will allow you to use your router or even switches that have router OS on it with MQTT. It's not just an MQTT client either. It can also act as an MQTT broker and have Mosquito running on it. You do have to do some command line stuff to get it working, but the commands to me look fairly straightforward and it looks like the got plenty of documentation to get you started. I think for some home lab enthusiasts that use Mikrotik, this will be quite a game changer because it means they can monitor all their switches and routers remotely and even maybe change some of the settings as well. Now that you know some of the great devices that take advantage of MQTT, let's explain what it is in a bit more detail to get you up and running. So there's a few basic concepts to understand. So the first is that it uses a what you call pub sub model. So that's publish and subscribe whereby you publish messages to a topic and then a client subscribes to that topic to receive the messages back. An example of a topic is home assistant forward slash binary underscore sensor. This is a topic that home assistant subscribes to by default and it will create sensors under those subtopics. So for example, binary sensor is one domain and there'll be one for other domains in home assistant as well to create those entities. When it comes to choosing a topic name, I would recommend sticking to lowercase letters and not having spaces in them. It just makes it more likely that it's going to be compatible with more applications and it's also easier to remember. It's good to have a name and convention for any things like this that you create. Home Assistant is the default for Home Assistant, but you can change this in the configuration as well. The next important thing to know about is what's called QoS and that stands for quality of service. So when you send a message you can define a QoS, it's either 0, 1 or 2. For 0 it's basically fire and forget, so the message gets sent and you don't know whether it's been received successfully or not. With 1 it gets sent and you do know that it's been received successfully, but it might also have possibly been sent more than once. Whereas with number two, that ensures that it's sent only once and there's a bit of handshake that goes on to ensure that it's been received only once. Using a quality of service of one or two does use up a bit more system resources. So if it's things like temperature or humidity sensors, you might be able to get away with a zero instead. But otherwise I'd recommend sticking with using quality of service one or two. You probably won't have enough sensors anyway to overload the broker, so you might as well. The next thing to know about is the keep alive timeout. So basically there's a timeout that you can define when you create an MQTT connection. And after this time, the connection will time out if a message hasn't been received. If a message hasn't been received within that time, then the client should send a ping message by default to keep the connection alive. If this doesn't happen, then the broker assumes that the connection has been terminated. Something that's related to this is called LWT, and this stands for Last Will Testament. I really like this because what it does is it helps ensure that you know that the device is still online or not. And what happens is, is the client defines the message when it makes a connection. So it defines an LWT message, but it's actually the broker that sends out this message if a connection has been lost. So if a message has failed to be sent within the Keep Alive time window, or if a connection has been terminated, then it will send this LWT message out to people that are subscribed to that topic. So this is really useful because you can use it to determine if a device is offline or not. So you won't have a situation where a device has been offline for a week and you just find out about it. 
Another thing you should know about is that you can send a message as either retained or not retained. If you send a message as retained, then what that means is, is that when a new client connects to the broker and then subscribes to a topic, it will retrieve that retained message. Whereas if it subscribes and the messages that were sent weren't retained, then it won't receive previous messages. So basically, if a message isn't retained, then people that are subscribed will only receive the message if they're connected at that point in time that the message is sent. Otherwise, if it's a retained message, then new clients connecting can also get those messages. I would say that typically status messages, such as the state of a device being on or off, would be a retained message so that then say for example home assistant connects it knows the current state of that device of whether it's on or off whereas commands you would not typically send as a retained message because you could have a situation whereby a device reconnects and then picks up that retained message and then issues that command again so for example if you send an on command to turn a light on and there's connection issues it might turn the light on and then it might have connection issues, someone turns the light off, it reconnects, and then the light turns itself back on again. I've had this a couple of times in the past where I set things up incorrectly, where lights were turning on randomly and I couldn't figure out what was causing it. A similar setting is what's called a persistent connection setting, and this allows you to receive messages even if the connection has been dropped. So this helps mitigate some of the issues around using non-retained messages. To see what messages look like on the message broker, you can use an app like MQTT Explorer. So you can see here, that you can do a connection to a broker and then once you're connected it has a nice display of a tree down the left with all the different topics of messages that have been sent and then you can see the flashing ones whereby messages are being sent now so you can see that the Shelley's and Home Assistant topics are really quite active from my different devices in Home Assistant if you want to look at MQTT messages in there there is actually a service whereby you can dump out MQTT messages from a certain topic so this can be useful for debugging I personally personally just use the MQTT Explorer app myself to see what's going on but if you haven't got that then you can always use Home Assistant as well and you can also send MQTT messages using an automation. In the past I've used MQTT messages to store information temporarily and then reuse it later in an automation. Well hopefully this should be enough to get you started with MQTT. Drop a comment below on whether you use it already or if you plan to use it after watching this video. Well that's it for today so please consider subscribing if you haven't already and liking the video if you enjoyed it. So thanks until next time.